Risk Framework for Bitcoin Custody Operation with the Revault Protocol Written by myself, Jacob, and my collaborator, Antoine Let's start with a scenario Imagine that you are the Chief Financial Officer of a medium-sized company You've been gradually losing confidence in the dollar system as you notice the devaluation of the company's cash reserves along with asset inflation. You decide to allocate a portion of the company's balance sheet to Bitcoin as a hedge against the inflation risk. But you are left with a heap of questions. How do we, as a company, protect our funds? What regulations should we comply with? What kind of attacks do we need to worry about? Malware? Insiders? Criminal organisations? What investments can we make to objectively improve our risk posture? What types of insurance are available? Should we rely on a third-party custodian? If so, how are they protecting our funds? These questions set the broad context for the paper we are presenting. With this paper, we believe we are taking steps towards the future ecosystem of Bitcoin custody knowledge and services that will provide practical answers to these questions. There are two primary contributions with this paper. We propose the attack tree methodology for constructing a risk framework of custodial operations for Bitcoin. The emphasis is on risks that aren't captured by cryptographic and blockchain security models. Second, we present a risk framework for the Revolt protocol, an open source multi-party Bitcoin custody protocol. Bitcoin custody encompasses the protection of assets through software, hardware and operational processes. We're now seeing the emergence of open source custody protocols a critical ecosystem component for improving security standards. For users, insurance companies and regulators to have confidence in a custody protocol, it needs to be scrutinized by experts and an open security model is best suited for the broadest level of scrutiny. The foundation of Bitcoin custody is key management a well-understood topic in the academic literature and in practice. However, Bitcoin custody, in particular multi-stakeholder custody, involves human processes, communication protocols, network monitoring and response systems, software, hardware and physical security environments. Given a secure cryptographic layer, there are still vulnerabilities introduced at the application layer by software developers, at the hardware layer throughout the supply chain, and at the operations layer by users. Without adequate risk management frameworks for custodial operations, Bitcoin users are likely to suffer unexpected losses, whether they self-custody funds or employ a third-party custodian. The emerging custody protocols are trying to reconcile the needs of traditional businesses and banking with Bitcoin's novel, identity-less and irreversible transaction properties. Now I'll introduce Revolt to you, as it is the case study for our risk framework. Revolt is a multi-party custody protocol that distinguishes between stakeholders and fund managers. The primary protection for funds is a high threshold multi-signature script controlled by the stakeholders. The day-to-day -day operational overhead of fund management is simplified by enabling portions of funds to be delegated to fund managers. Stakeholders define spending policies in line with traditional controls of expenses and have automated servers to enforce these policies. In addition, a deterrent is withheld by each stakeholder 
to mitigate incentives to physically threaten them. To achieve this, Revolt makes use of sets of pre-signed transactions coupled with an active defense mechanism for detecting and responding to attempted theft transactions. I won't describe Revolt here in full, but I will mention the most important concepts related to the components and the transaction set. Each stakeholder and manager has a hardware security module to manage their private keys and generate signatures for transactions. A backup of private keys is stored for each hardware security module in a separate protected physical environment. Each stakeholder and manager uses a wallet software to track their co-owned bitcoins, craft transactions, store transaction signatures, and communicate with each other through a coordinator. The coordinator is a proxy server that simplifies communication for the multi-party wallet. Stakeholders each have one or more watchtower, which is an online server that enforces stakeholders' spending policy limitations. Stakeholders each have an anti-replay Oracle server. This is the transaction set structure in the Revolt protocol. Specific transaction types create and consume specific unspent transaction outputs, or UTXOs. Funds enter custody through a deposit transaction. The majority of funds are locked as a deposit UTXO, which can only be accessed with the cooperation of all stakeholders. To discuss ownership of Bitcoins, we refer to a generalization of a locking script called a script descriptor. The wallet will have multiple addresses that correspond to a single abstracted descriptor. The deposit descriptor describes an N of N multi-signature script among the N stakeholders. Once a deposit transaction is confirmed, stakeholders will sign but not broadcast an emergency transaction that locks funds to an emergency descriptor. The emergency descriptor is intentionally not standardized by the protocol, except that it must be harder to unlock than the deposit descriptor. It could, for example, be an X of X multi-signature script among the N stakeholders and an additional X minus N other parties, such as insurance companies, security professionals, family members, etc. Each stakeholder wields a set of emergency transactions as a deterrent against vicious physical threats. A panic button or a dead man switch could be used to broadcast these transactions. And therefore, an attacker would find it very difficult to attack the stakeholders without any of them triggering the emergency transaction broadcast. If triggered, an attacker loses the opportunity to steal deposited funds and stealing funds from the emergency descriptor is, by definition, much more difficult. The expected payoff for an attack is significantly reduced. An unvault transaction consumes the deposit UTXO and creates an unvault UTXO, locked to the unvault descriptor, which is redeemable by either the N stakeholders or the M managers along with N automated anti-replay oracles after X blocks. A cancel transaction consumes the unvault UTXO and creates a new deposit UTXO. The watchtower's role is to broadcast the cancel transaction if a fraudulent spend attempt is detected, either through an unauthorized attempt at broadcasting an unvault transaction or if a spend transaction does not abide by the spending policy. The time lock gives watchtowers X blocks worth of time to broadcast a cancel transaction. 
An Unvault Emergency Transaction consumes the Unvault UTXO and locks funds to the Emergency Descriptor. It has the same purpose as the Emergency Transaction, only it consumes the Unvault UTXO rather than the Deposit UTXO. A Spend Transaction is used by managers to pay to external addresses. I'll now discuss the risk framework that we constructed from attack trees. Consider the key life cycle of a custodial operation. There are three phases, initialization, operation, and termination. Initialization is where wallet and communication keys are generated, where software integrity is verified, hardware security modules are checked, and relevant public information is shared among participants. Operation encompasses the active fund management. Termination is the phase wherein the wallet is decommissioned and all sensitive information is destroyed. In this paper, we focus on the operations phase. We aim to cover the initialization and termination in future work. We present a risk framework for high-level risk analyses for the integration of custody into a multi-stakeholder context. To date, the literature has focused primarily on cryptographic security modeling, dealing with low-level risks associated with cryptographic primitives, key management protocols, hardware security modules, and single-party wallets. The underlying cryptographic security is fundamental, but should be complemented by an operational security model which is much more likely to be the domain where participants create vulnerabilities for an attacker. Advanced custody protocols that use multi-layer access control with both static and active defenses for insider and external attackers demands a whole system approach to security analysis from low level to high level. So why attack trees? In short, they allow us to capture attacks that compromise a multi-layered defense. More formally, we determine several requirements for our modeling formalism. The ability to represent complex processes with numerous components and events, support qualitative risk analysis, support automated quantitative methods for multi-attribute risk analysis, to produce readily comprehensible and visual models that are more amenable to open source intelligence and extensible and modular models to support differential analysis and reuse of modules. Attack trees have an attack at their root and branches that capture alternate with or and complementary with and attack pathways comprised of intermediate attack goals as non-leaf nodes and basic attack steps as leaf nodes. As is common within the literature, we extend the basic attack tree to support sequential conjunction of branches with SAND, sequential AND, allowing us to model an attack where some subtree of an attack pathway has to occur before and in addition to another subtree. The logical gates, OR and SAND, shown with each node, applied to the next node at the same depth. This means that at any given depth, a node with a SAND gate occurs before other nodes that are shown below it. To be concise, rather than having several copies of the same subtree, we write X times to note that the subtree has to happen X times. During an analysis, these subtrees should be considered as X separate AND subtrees, since they are contextually different, corresponding to different participants or different remote and physical environments. Here is an example. The attack trees are presented as nested lists for brevity. 
Common subtrees were factorized and labeled so they can be referred to in multiple different attacks. At the root of this tree, we have the attack broadcast theft transactions that consume all deposit UTXOs. Let's wander through the attack tree to get a sense of how to conceptualize the attack. First, an attacker must determine D, the set of deposit UTXOs. Then, an attacker must determine the locking script for the deposit UTXO for each UTXO in D. And satisfy, that is, sign and unlock an input in a theft transaction that consumes the identified deposit UTXO, again for each UTXO in D. Each of these steps refers to a commonly reused subtree. We'll take a deeper look into step two, labeled by H. To determine the locking script for a deposit UTXO, an attacker must either compromise any participant's wallet, or compromise a watchtower, or compromise an anti-replay oracle. This follows from the fact that the locking script is deterministically derived from the set of public keys which are stored by each participant and machine other than the coordinator. Now let's take a quick look at a subtree referenced by H. Consider D, how to compromise a server, in this case, a watchtower or anti-replay oracle. There are three main branches, a remote attack or physical attack or human participant attack. A remote attack can be carried out by exploiting a software vulnerability or by exploiting a human vulnerability. With D1.2, we have reached a leaf node, a basic attack step. One of the difficulties in modeling a realistic system this way is in capturing the right level of detail. Without additional context, such as who the relevant system administrator is and how likely they are to succumb to a phishing attack. It's difficult to further decompose this attack step. It is an adequate level of generalization to apply to any deployment instance of Revolt, but it may be extended when the framework is used for quantitative risk analysis within a real deployment. This brings us on to the final topic risk analysis. The library of attack trees we provide are the framework that supports both qualitative and quantitative risk analyses for specific deployment instances of Revolt custody. A qualitative analysis can be used to gauge, for example, what kind of expertise or specialist hardware uh, may be required for an attack. This is useful in itself, or can be combined with a quantitative risk analysis to explore scenarios with different attacker profiles. To perform a context-specific quantitative risk analysis, you can make a set of estimates using in-house empirical data, public research, and expert opinion for each basic attack step on different attributes such as monetary cost, execution time, or likelihood. With that, a bottom-up procedure from the leaf nodes to the root should be used to compute aggregated attributes. Then, Bayesian methods can be used to update prior estimates with more refined values as new data sources emerge. By determining costs, likelihoods and other attributes for risks associated with custodial processes, an organization can perform a differential analysis of countermeasures until they find a configuration wherein their risk tolerance is satisfied. An explicit framework not only helps an organization deploying Revolt with risk management, but could form a standard by which insurance companies and regulators consider specific deployments. 
As with any model of complex reality, attack trees are imperfect and cannot capture every possible attack pathway. But the alternative, complete ignorance, is not better. Our intention is to utilize open source community input and gather data from live revolt deployments to improve the model's accuracy, to reduce risks inherent in Bitcoin custody. So let's return to our initial scenario. You are a chief financial officer who has decided to put Bitcoin on your company's balance sheet. Do you feel more confident in how to proceed given the availability of an open source custody protocol with clearly enumerated risks? Would you find it easier to trust a third party custodian who uses an open source custody protocol with clearly enumerated risks? Thank you.